Okay, so welcome to this afternoon session. My name is Wayne Reid. I'm a Baswell England professional officer and social worker. And I also have our co-chair, Helen Wood. So I'll come to in a moment. And our guest speaker, Wendy Tomlinson, who is our guest speaker this afternoon. If I could come to Helen next, then please. Hi there. Welcome, everybody. Um, yes, as Wayne said, I'm the co-chair for the Criminal Justice Group alongside Caroline Bald, um, who I don't think can make it today, unfortunately. Um, so, yes, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'll let Wendy introduce herself in more depth in a moment. <coughs> we have a range of people in the criminal justice group, people from practice, still still involved in criminal justice practice, which is my background before going into higher education, um, people from HE, people with lived experience and a mix of all of those. So thank you for joining. If you're interested in attending criminal justice group meetings in the future or being part of that, you know, being part of our group, please do get in touch with Wayne and myself. We'd love to hear from you. We're always looking to increase our numbers in terms of the sort of policy and engagement work that we do. So please do come on board. Um, so I'm going to say welcome to Wendy, who is also a member of our group in addition to doing the talk today. So thanks, Wendy. Um, Wendy has a long history of criminal justice social work and up until recently was working for the Youth Custody Service. So I'll hand over to you, Wendy, to tell us a bit more about your background and leading for today. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. And thanks very much, Wayne. So as Helen and Wayne said, I'm Wendy Tomlinson. I'm um, a Basel Criminal Justice Group member and I'm a social worker, obviously. I've worked in lots of different parts of local authority children's social care including um, youth justice and I also worked in the youth custody service and therefore I've got that particular insight and I wrote an article for the professional social work magazine about my experience of those four years and used as a bit of a backdrop for that the latest HMI prisons kind of annual report into children in custody so you'll see if you read that article the kind of mention of, of of that if you like that was kind of the backdrop to it now what i what i want to start by saying is this is very much my perspective of the world and how i think it will be helpful to you i'm really conscious that in this virtual room are people who know this world and some of the things I'm going to talk about in much more sophisticated detail than I do but I was in a quite a unique post not quite a unique post very unique post and in a unique position and I think that brought something that not many of us ever get a chance to really see in the way that I saw it which is uh, what I'd like to do this was what, what I just said about there being in a unique po position and you know the kind of why me if you like why, why am I doing this so the youth custody service was created um, after a transfer and a change of functions from the YJB so you might remember in really simplistic terms the YJB used to commission services from the prison service for the young offender institutions the YOIs and what happened was that the YCS changed that so that they managed either directly or by commissioning and contract management all of the provisions where children are held in custody on justice grounds and it's important to say on justice grounds you, rather than on welfare grounds or on mental health grounds so at that time in, in uh, 2017 the senior leaders in the youth custody service um, so the youth custody service then sits inside of the prison service and i think that's really important in understanding why the YCS might think in the way that it does, if you like. But what the senior leaders did was they commissioned something called the Safeguarding Review. It's really easy to find online, just Google YCS Safeguarding Review. It was published in October 2019. And one of the recommendations was um, that they have a, a manager, senior manager, who is of a safeguarding children's background rather than of a prison service background and that's what they were looking for and that's when they got me now in that same year earlier that same year 2019 the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse ICSA 
published one of its reports, which was about children in custody. Um, and anybody reading that report would see the history of sexual abuse in custodial institutions. So you'd kind of see that a historic story. But um, anybody who knows anything about safeguarding can only read that report and think, well, this can only be still going on, if you like. You can't read it and go, well, that's ancient history and it doesn't happen anymore. Um, you have to read it and kind of go, hmm, yeah, that's probably still still the way the world is. Maybe in different ways or maybe to a different extent, but, it, but it, it's still there. So coming into the YCS, it was important that many of the people that were surrounding me in my day job, not all, but many, were of a prison service background. And what that means is that the way that they understood their safeguarding responsibilities was through a different lens than the way that many children's social workers would see those responsibilities. And that's really important. And, and I mean, it's an example when I first went to talk to some kind of senior leaders in children's social care, local authority children's social care about the safeguarding review, they kind of went, why does it, why does it use these words in these ways, Wendy? What's that about? And I said, this report was written by prison officers, really, really senior and good prison officers with really well in good intentions, but it was written by prison officers. So they see the world a bit differently. Um, and I just would kind of use that caveat if you like i'm not sure it's a caveat to to explain explain that the ycs is at the point that i left it it was five younger offender institutions it's now four many of you will know that cook and wood changed its functions to hold adults it was one secure training center oak hill and it was beds in eight secure children's homes at that stage now during the time i worked there we had seconded to us a manager from a youth offending team who was also the chair of the Association of Yacht Managers. She's also a social worker. Um, she won't mind me naming her because I've talked to her recently. And that's Hazel Williamson. And she wrote an article in the Association of Yacht Managers bulletin that said, you know what, I think that criminal justice professionals in the community including but not exclusively social workers would do well to think about and take responsibility for that what is their responsibilities to their children in custody so that she was surprised and I was surprised by how often something would happen to a child in custody and the people in the community who were responsible for that child would not engage quite so proactively and authoritatively as we might wish them to. So this was the, that was about the voice of community professionals, about holding others to account. And it was that that drove Hazel to write that article. And it was that that drove me to write the, the professional social work article. I think one of the things that happened that I felt I was doing a lot when I was in the YCS was translating between two words. A prison officer responsible for a child would ask for something and a community social worker would answer that question and you'd, I'd quite, we'd quite often find ourselves thinking, why don't they like our answer? And it's like, because you're both speaking different languages, that's why. Speaking different languages coming from different, different perspectives. But something that's important in the beginning of that, and it's why I chose this slide and called it the value we place on childhood, is about how we see children. So the, the, the YCS will talk about children and has worked hard to, to make sure that the language is about children, children that we are responsible for in the YCS. But you will see that some of the policies and procedures around how we manage children in young offender institutions, and there's, a, there's not many of them nowadays, but how those children are managed the guidance is very prison orientated. So the, the idea that these are vulnerable children is not front and centre of the thinking of many people who work in those establishments. Now that does sound quite shocking, but so I'm going to explain, explain a little bit. So you may be aware of the Howard League for Penal Reform in 2002 took the government, as was then the department, to judicial review because the department, so it was before the Ministry of Justice as it stands now, it's, I think it was the Home Office, the Howard League said, we think the Children Act 1989 applies to children in custody and the government of the day said, no, we don't think it does. It doesn't apply in the same way and it went to judicial review 
and that was held, that judicial review was overseen by the previous president of the family division, Sir James Munby. Of course, you don't have to look very far on the Howard League's website to see that they won. The Children Act 1989 does apply to children in custody. Now, anyone who cares about children may be quite shocked that anybody was ever considering that it wouldn't apply to children in custody. But I think that tells you something about the adultification of children who offend generally. Now, adultification, of course, has, it's in the, um, you know, the kind of common narrative of anybody who works with teenagers nowadays, and particularly in relation to black children. What I would suggest is, yes, it does apply to black children, but actually what we'll find is when we're talking about young people who have committed crime, young people who have offended, we are often problematizing those children. We're often looking at those children as the source of the problem rather than children with needs, if you like. And quite often we will layer responsibility on those children when we, as the professionals and the adults around them, may not have served them well earlier in their life in a way that would, would support them well. So what I would say is the vast majority of the children that I ever encountered when I worked in the YCS for those four years, the vast majority of those children were very vulnerable children whose vulnerable needs were known much earlier in their lives. That doesn't mean those needs were easy to meet, and I'm not seeking to lay blame on any particular profession or organisation, but these, the, these were children whose needs were known earlier in their lives, and I would argue if those needs had been really well met earlier in their lives, we may not be in the position um, that we were in of having them in custody because they may not have committed the crime that they had committed that got them into custody, which of course means some people wouldn't have been harmed and some people wouldn't have been killed by those children. And some of those people who were harmed or killed were also children. So there's, there's something very important in this conversation about the value we place on childhood when we are talking about children who are heading, they're knocking on the door of emerging adulthood when actually their childhood has not prepared them for that adulthood in, in one way, shape or form. And because quite often these are older children, big children, boys, often black children who we know are adultified, imagine all of that. No wonder the people who are working with them day to day are struggling to see the childhood in them. So I kind of that's a, a bit of a backdrop of this story. Next, then on my list is a bit of a discussion about the structures and systems around children that allow us to safeguard our children in custody. Now, the reason that I think this is important is because it's surprising how often it gets lost in the conversation. And it's also something that we as professional social workers who are responsible for children in custody need to have in our pockets and use in order to help us to meet the needs of those children and safeguard those children. So the first one, and again, there will be people on this call who know this much more intimately than I do, but the first one is National Standards for Youth Justice. So standard four is all about how, um, how youth justice or youth offending teams, youth justice services and yacht management boards assure themselves that their children who are placed in custody are safe and are cared for well, are um, prepared for release and and rehabilitate, you know, kind of prepared for coming home well, um, and that they're kept safe, you know, the whole journey from the moment that we know they're going to custody all the way to all the way to coming home. Now, there are several things in that space. If you are a youth justice worker or a social worker, how do you how do you help your your youth uh, yacht management board or your youth justice service manager? How do you help them to know that those children in custody are safe? Now, they can ask strategic um, questions 
of their local YOI, their local STC, the places where your children have been placed. They can ask questions about how do you safeguard our children? How do you, um, what action do you take when there's, when a child comes to harm? What action do you take to make sure that the child has got their educational needs met? That site, that organisation will inevitably talk generally and generically about what they do. What they won't do, they'll say, you know, here's our policy, here's our procedure, here's how, here's the processes that we go to keep children safe, all of which are really, really valuable, but none of which are necessarily specific to your child in custody today. And of course, in that, many, many, many youth offending teams will have one child in custody. Some have none at all, and some have not had any for a while. Even the ones who have got multiple children in custody have not got lots. And I'm, I know I'm speaking about a place that I, I, I stopped working there in October last year, um, but it hasn't changed that much. So even the youth justice teams that have got lots of kids in custody, we're talking about six or eight, we're not talking about 40 or 50. So even so, you as a youth justice worker or social worker for that child can be asking those questions. How do I know that my child's educational needs are met, that my child is safe? So I'm going to come back to that and come into a little bit more detail. All of the provisions of the Children Act 1989 apply to children in custody. So if you've got a child in a YOI, the local authority where that YOI is, is responsible um, in the same way that they are for any other children in their geography. Of course, if those children are the subjects, are if they're in the care system, um, then the responsibility is with the local authority who either has the care order or uh, who, who is the corporate parent, which may not be where the, in fact, most of the time it isn't where the YOI is. But headline there is the Children Act 1989 applies to our children in custody exactly the same as it does to children in the community. Children Act 2004, really important because it, it mentions governors of YOIs. <coughs> governors of YOIs and directors of the STC um, and specifically makes them accountable under Section 11 of the Children Act for making sure that those children are safe. What most um, establishments, YOIs or, or the STC, do is that they will do an audit under section 11 that says here's how I know that our children are safe and that audit will go typically to the, y the, the local safeguarding partnership where the YOI is. So another responsibility, another thing you can ask about. Um, under working together to safeguard children, all of the provisions um, apply to our children in custody in the same way because they're just children like anybody else. This sometimes feels complex for some people when we're talking about early help services because some people would argue that children in custody are not early help services. Well, ask yourself that question based on that child's needs and how they have or haven't been met. But the whole of the provision of working together applies. Typical key in there is the requirement on local safeguarding partnerships that when they do an annual review of the safeguarding partnership, their annual report, if there is a secure establishment in their area, they are required to do to give consideration for how restraint is being managed in that establishment. Now, at least one of the local safeguarding partnerships in the time that I worked there went above and beyond in this regard and asked further questions about safeguarding. What was very interesting about that particular establishment, and I'm not naming names for obvious reasons, is that they would write to youth justice teams who had lot who were the kind of most common customers for that YOI, if you like. They'd write and they'd say, the local safeguarding partnership, we're doing our annual report of HMYOI wherever. You have had children placed there this year. Can you tell us something about your experiences of their ability to safeguard these children? That safeguarding partnership told me frequently that those youth offending teams didn't respond. 
So missing a trick to help the system to take care of those children. Legal Aid Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Act 2012, Section 104, creates the provision that children who are remanded, so if you're not yet 18 and you are remanded into custody, um, you, are, you are a looked after child. Now that's regardless of whether you've been a looked after child before under um, Section 20 of the Children Act or under Section 31, even if neither of those applied, you are a looked after child. Now, of course, when that was created, it was created to lay a responsibility on local authorities for alternatives to remand, bail packages and so on. Um, and it was incentivizing those local authorities. But it also begs the question, and this is at least in part a personal view, also begs the question that if a child is committing an offence that is serious enough that they are being remanded into custody, that might suggest that that child has needs that may or may not have been met, been previously met. And if that child comes into custody, is on remand and is treated as a looked after child, then all of the things that we require in process to take care of looked after children, initial health assessments, personal education plans, looked after reviews, care planning and so on. All of that applies, which means that we wrap around that child in a very um, kind of concrete way, which also means, of course, when that child leaves care, they don't just drop off the face of the earth. They are required to leave with a plan. There's required to be a plan. Now, that may be a pathway plan, if the provisions of the Leaving Care Act apply, but even if they don't, if a child exits care, they are required, the local authority are required to say, have we got this right? Is that the right plan? Are we assessing the needs of this child appropriately before they go home? Um, and every local authority will do that slightly differently, but that is in the care planning regulation. So it helps you to think about how do we hold accountability for making sure that this child's needs have been met now, what I would want to say is, and this speaks to what I said about being a bit of a translator, in the time that I worked in the youth custody service, I was often saying to my colleagues in, in the YOIs and the STCs, I was often helping them to hold the community to account. So they would say, you know, this child's coming out in, in three weeks, Wendy, and we haven't got anywhere for him to go. So it would be, how do we use these provisions to hold the community to account for their responsibility for these children? So, and I can say a little bit about when I see it, when I've, ever, when I've ever seen it worked well, work well, it works well because people use these provisions robustly. So, so I do, I do argue and I do think that the system is wrong. In an ideal world, children wouldn't be in YOIs at all because they are not set up to take care of really vulnerable children. But it is what we have at the moment, um, notwithstanding that the secure school, I think, is opening as we speak. But it is YOIs are what we have at the moment, and we do have provisions that will help us work with them. So that's why I'm kind of highlighting these as a way of as a way of using those. So Wayne, if you'd like to go to the next slide, but I'd quite like to pause for breath in case anybody wants to come in there. Take a moment to grab my tea. And no pressure. I'm not offended if nobody comes in, as long as you can still hear me. <laughs> So, Wendy, I'm happy to come in for a moment just to give you uh, a pause because I know what it's like uh, speaking and uh, there's not much response sometimes. No uh, so <laughs> just to give you a, just a minute, just from my own experience uh, quite a while ago now, but having worked in youth justice services and uh, the probation service, my feeling towards the end of my kind of experience there was that there was a, a strong emphasis on the kind of punishment and enforcement uh, aspect of offender management as it became to came to be known uh, as opposed to the kind of rehabilitation uh, aspect and i just wondered what your own reflections were on that from a youth custody service perspective please wayne i, I absolutely agree with you that's the first thing and and this slide that i'm going to go through in a minute says a little bit about that right. and I do, I do think that the, the focus for the prison service generally, but certainly um, from the YOI's point of view, 
if they have a focus, I mean, it's, there's very, there's a lot about just day to day management, you know, getting your children out of one room and into another behind a locked door. There's an awful lot that that's, you know, can we say that we've done this today? And I'll come to that a little bit. Okay. But, but there's really, there is a lot about our job is about reducing offending or reducing reoffending. Mm -hmm. Now, I would argue that in order to reduce reoffending, in a really vulnerable teenager whose needs have not been well met through their life, actually what we need to do is to focus on the holistic needs of the child okay. rather than just on how do I stop you offending, yeah. if you like. Yeah. So, so I absolutely agree with you in, in that space. Um, and I, I do think um, you'll, hear, you'll hear phrases in various parts of the kind of academic thinking, in some of the YJB's thinking, um, in some youth justice services thinking, you'll hear, you'll hear things about child first, treating the child as a child first, offender second. I would say child first, offender 20 second. Yeah, put that a lot, because why should it even be second? Maybe it needs to be a lot further down the list. Maybe there's a, hundred, you know, a dozen other things before that that are kind of features of the child's identity and needs. So, so that's, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. And also, I think that there is a narrative that to treat children as children first becomes, it almost becomes kind of synonymous with hearing their voice. And I would say, well, that's really important. In safeguarding children, their voice is an important feature of that, but it's not the only feature of that. So if a child says, no, I want to do this, I want to do that, and those things that they want to do are harmful, does that mean that we let them or do we do something else? Do you see what I mean? And of course, the answer is we do something else. But the something else is harder when we're also trying to afford our children agency because they are 16 and 17 and they're knocking on the door of adulthood. So they need to have a say in their lives. Do you see what I mean? I so, Wayne, I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I'll let you cool. continue. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, if nobody else wants to come in, I'm going to move on to this slide a bit. So this is about structures and systems. So the structures and systems in custody. I'm really conscious as I say this, that I'm primarily talking about young offender institutions and the Secure Training Centre. Secure children's homes um, also have children on justice grounds, but they also have children on welfare grounds and are are governed, as you know, by, um, by um, secure children's regulations, which are uh, kind of a children's homes regulations. That means that the staff work in them often see themselves differently. They don't see themselves as kind of, off, you know, prison officers and custodial staff. They see themselves as people who are there to take care of children. Um, staff who work in the YOIs and to some degree the STC, though, though Oak Hill is um, increasingly unique at the point that I left the YCS, um, but the staff that work in the YOIs are prison officers first, primarily. There are, in, in, uh, certainly at the point that I left the YCS, there were seconded social workers in each of the YOIs from the local authority where the YOI is based. And you'll recall that in um, Professional Social Work magazine late last year, they um, contributed to an article um, about what a day in their life looks like. Um, so, you know, there is there is social work in, in that space. And of course, there are other professionals in that space as well. So and I can say a little bit more about about those going forward. But the vast majority of the staff that work in there with your children are prison officers by background. Now, why does that matter? That doesn't mean for a second that they don't care about children, but they are not steeped in the same um in the same culture and thinking about safeguarding children that a children's social worker will be. Um, so I've worked with some amazing prison officers in my time, but their focus, their way of operating is slightly different and they will be driven by a few things. So one thing to think about is their career trajectory is typically somewhere else in the prison system. So if they're going to be promoted, they might stay in their own establishment, 
but equally they might decide well actually I'm going to go and get this job that's in this other establishment which of course doesn't necessarily mean that it's another part of the uh, under 18 estate the YCS estate for example so um, but they are driven by the YOI rules which are um, young offender institution rules easy to find online um, they use what will feel like old-fashioned language I think it's fair to say but it's it's worth knowing what they are because it helps you to understand why the staff that you're talking to will be focused on something different than you will as a children's social worker similarly the STC rules um, now STC rules are a little bit different to the YOI rules but there are a lot of similarities a key thing that's different and is really different to secure children's homes is this idea of last resort and restraint so most of us who work with children would not put hands on children on a child unless they were actively and immediately presenting a danger to others in the YOIs they can put hands on children for good order and discipline um, and that's something that's quite different to other, other parts of the world. That means that if you haven't done what I've told you to do and I've given you a clear and direct lawful order and you still don't do it, I can restrain you to get you from A to B. So it does, it does mean that and it does sometimes happen. Ne next on my little list there is um, PSIs. These are prison service instructions. You'll hear of PSIs, prison service instructions, and PSOs, prison service orders. Now, the reason I think PSIs are important is many of the prison officers that I've met and worked with in my time in the YCS, this is their Bible. The PSIs are their Bible. It's the thing that helps them know what they can and can't do. So it's, it is important and it's worth knowing what some of those are. Now, during my time in the YCS, there was an endeavour to update the PSIs that needed to have a greater child focus into something with a greater child focus. And it's why we um, publicised when I was in the YCS the uh, <clears throat> uh, safeguarding policy, for example. So because that was a, an intention to um, update uh, and a step in the direction of updating some of the old PSIs. At the point that I left the YCS, they were working on updating the old care and management of children PSI into something that felt more child friendly and included safeguarding. But it's worth knowing what they are because it drives the way the prison officers think. The prison services kind of tagline is I'm going to preventing offending by changing lives or something something like that so as you can see their primary thought is about the prevention of offending public safety ie stop somebody hurting someone else and preventing offending what it isn't necessarily is how do I make these children safer and how do I make them more able to operate and engage in the world how do I create better outcomes for children that's on their list but it's our job as the people who know that world well to push that up the list so when you've got prison staff saying you know our job is to protect the public well our child is one of the public and we need him to be protected or her to be protected in that mission in that endeavor to safeguard everybody and in order to do that our child's needs to be our child's needs need to be met okay so um and all of what I've just said there is is um, kind of underpinned by the way that people who work in custody are trained, what drives them, what they're measured on every day, what they think good looks like and how they identify themselves. So that's um, um, uh, an important part of the way that staff who work in the YOIs will think. And then, of course, there are societal expectations. And this speaks a little bit to what I was saying about the adultification of our children and the value we do or we don't place on childhood. So just a, just a bit of food for thought in this space. Whenever there's a horrific, horrific incident out there in the community, you know, one child stabbing another, what do you hear on the news and what do you hear ostensibly from the families of those children? What you hear is calls for greater sentencing for knife crime 
don't we? That's the, that's the language that we hear is, you know, how can we punish harder? Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that if you are um, uh, a victim of such offending or if you have lost somebody um, because they are a victim to that offending, of course, um, that will create a particular response in you that you want a particular outcome. But we, uh, w wouldn't it be amazing if we were also asking ourselves, what's going on in the world that means that some children, some young people are so terrified and so frightened that they, they, they think that killing another child or hurting, seriously hurting another child is a way of managing their world. What's going on in what's going on that makes our children think think it's appropriate or right or OK to kill each other or hurt each other? Now, forgive my kind of slightly dramatic delivery there, but because there are a smaller number of children in custody than there was, say, a decade, two decades ago, because that number has gone down so much, what that does mean is that the children in custody are very often there for much more serious offending. So while I'm talking about murder um, and that making that sound quite dramatic, that is a significant proportion of those children in custody, um, serious offending like that, if you like. That's not to say that there aren't children in custody who could who don't need to be there, who could be out in the community with the right support around them, because there are most definitely. But I don't talk I don't talk about kind of serious offending to be dramatic. It's because that is the reality of quite a lot of the children who are in are in custody at the moment. So just just a little bit about some of the things that happen inside of custody that you might all want to think about when asking questions about about your children. So incidents. So an incident can mean all sorts of things. It often involves restraint. It often involves somebody getting hurt, however majorly or minorly. Um, and it often in includes um, at least one child and quite often more than that, not following instructions of some kind and action needing to be taken to enforce that in some way. So um, if you're a yacht worker or a social worker and somebody says to you, um, your child was involved in an incident, ask more questions because you won't necessarily get all of the detail in that first um, in that first email, in that first mention, not least because the resettlement practitioner that's sending it to you probably doesn't know all of it at that stage. They've got to go from one side of the prison to the other and try and find some of this out. Um, and of course, the staff who were involved in it, who were restraining the child, for example, they'll be debriefing first. You know, they'll be catching breath first. They won't be, the first thing on their mind won't be to update you. So you will need to go and ask those questions. Was my child hurt? Um, was anybody else hurt? Has the child been debriefed? What did they say when they were debriefed? When are you planning to debrief? What did the health professional say when they saw the child? If ever there's an incident, they'll see a health professional afterwards. What did the health professional say? And what is the next step? Not just did they get offered a health professional, because those of you who work with teenagers will know that sometimes if a health professional knocks on a child's door and says, are you OK? They'll just say, yeah, go away. But no, they're often not OK. My experience is children would tell me, no, I was restrained three weeks ago and, and this, you know, my wrist still hurts, my shoulder still hurts. Well, if you can tell me that, then you can tell a health professional. So what what's the next, you know, what's the next step? So what's happening next? So ask more questions. Um, restraint is commonplace in the YOIs. And even if it's changed in the six or seven months since I've been there, it will still be more common, considerably common. Um, most children will have witnessed restraint. Many children will have been restrained. So it's always worth asking whenever you're interacting with a YOI or the STC about your child. Have they been restrained? When were they restrained? What was the outcome of the debrief? What's changed because of the debrief? What, if and how were they hurt? And what health, you know, what health activity has taken place following that? Um, and what's going to happen to reduce the need to restrain in the future? 
So restraint is commonplace. It's also worth asking the child about what, what does it feel like to watch it? Because it can be pretty, um, well, not can be, it often is pretty dramatic to watch that. So taught, T-O-O-R, time out of room. Um, this is a really good example of a, of a cultural difference. YOI staff will be well used to measuring time out of room. So timing it, how long have you had out of your room today? Much more important question is, so what did you do while you were out of the room that was useful to you, that created better outcomes for you, that was inspiring for you as a child, uh, that met your needs, that met your aspirations? But equally, while you were inside your room, what were you doing? Who was noticing you? Who was taking care of you? Who was checking in on you? Be under no illusion, if a child is in their room in a YOI, it's a cell, and they are locked in. So those doors aren't open for the, to allow the children to come and go. Um, so worth asking, uh, why or why we'll often talk about average time out of room. They mean across the whole population of children in their custody, but it's worth you asking, what does this mean for my child and what was he or she doing when they were out of room? Separation, next on my list. So children are separated under Rule 49 of the YOI rules, See, that's why it's worth reading them, which means that they are not in contact with other children and they are uh, being monitored um, by staff in a particular way. So they'll be, they should be having access to a whole range of professionals. Um, if they are separated under Rule 49, there'll be a plan to reintegrate them. And this is where you as community professionals can really come into your own because you know these children and you know what will work with them and what won't. Sometimes those children are separated because of the harm that they've caught, that the risk they pose to others or the risk that others pose to them. And sometimes you'll find that that's because of the way that that um, what one of the things that makes it harder for that child is some, sometimes in their own behaviour. So a question for you as the community professionals is how do we support that child and manage that behaviour to reduce that risk? So worth asking about has my child been separated? And even if they haven't, how much time out of room have they had? Similarly, self-harm. Children seem to children who don't necessarily self-harm a great deal in the community, or sometimes they do, will self-harm more in custody. And it's worth you bringing, as children's social workers, your expertise, or mental health social workers, your expertise about how to manage self-harm and reduce self-harm into the conversation with the professionals inside of the establishment because their primary concern will be removing whatever it is that that child is self-harming with so a ligature or a blade or a sharp something or other um, removing that by whatever means necessary which might include force what it doesn't necessarily include is the more subtle work which is about how do i help you as a child as your a professional around you, how do I help you to feel safer so that self-harm is a thing that you can do less and less often? So that's where your expertise really comes, it really comes into, because you'll know the child as well. Conflict resolution speaks to the separation work um, and it can speak to other work around incidents. This is um, if you work in a youth justice service or in children's social care, in contextual harm teams, whatever they might be called, where you are um, regularly dealing with children who are running county lines, who are living involved in gangs and that sort of conflict. Um, where is it possible to resolve some of those conflicts while, the, while those children are in custody? That can happen. It tends to happen more where people in the community push for that to happen. Similarly, where there is the need for um, family support. So uh, where you've got kind of family conflicts between, say, the child in custody and his mom, for example. So conflict resolution. Um, and uh, that's going to happen more if you push for it. And then the, la the last three I can kind of do together. The child's health needs and the child's education needs um, that they had in the community have not gone away and will only get well met in custody if you are in the, in the room 
you know, within the kind of virtual room, metaphorical room with those professionals saying, this is this child's educational needs, these are their targets, how are they being met? How do we know that this child is, this child who can't read is learning to read? This child who wants to be a hairdresser is learning to do that. This child who wants to be a brick player is learning to do that. This child who can't tell time is learning to do that. So really having concrete educational targets that are the same as they were in the community, but pushing for them in custody because the education provision isn't as strong and not as individualized typically. Ditto health needs. Um, so you've got health needs, I don't know, child needs to see a dentist. The child needs to have their brace, you know, their teeth braces adjusted. The child had an injury while they were out in the community and they need ongoing care. All of that will happen much more robustly if you push it um, and sometimes you need to escalate it as well and I'll say a little bit more about that in in a moment the piece about escalating um, really important because sometimes the things that need to happen are within the gift of someone more senior in the establishment a bit like in local authorities where sometimes the person who makes a decision on something is a, is a more senior person so what you need to do as staff who work in local authorities might be that you need to give that person the right information to help them make a decision. An example would be if you've got a child who has got, um, I don't know, like a seriously bo broken bone out there in the community, they're now in custody and they're going to need ongoing um, care from a, uh, a bone specialist. There's a word for it that you'll know that I don't um, from a you know a, a doctor who's an expert in that so they're going to need to leave the establishment and go to hospital depending on the nature of their offense and their status they may well need to be handcuffed and escorted and also you know all sorts of other things that is a logistical challenge but it's a logistical possibility it happens more often if you as that child's advocate or worker are saying this needs to happen a governor can make that happen, so you, but you need to push. Your voice and children's voices. Advocacy. If your local authority or local area has an advocacy service and you want that child to avail themselves of advocacy from your community, they can, of course, have um, that child can have that advocate in custody. So they can go into custody and see them. The child has to ask for it. So purist advocacy. The child certainly has to ask for that to happen. But the YCS commissions an advocacy service so that the child's voice can be amplified and heard. Um, and it's very, um, it's, it very much focuses on uh, child led. So it makes much more sense if the child says, I want this, then it makes if you say you want this for them. So your role in that from the community, your role in that space is to be encouraging the child to talk to their advocates. They don't work for the prison service. They work for a separate organisation, usually a charity, usually who are experts in advocacy. Recently, it was Bernardo's. I think the, the, the um, contract will be out for recommissioning, but Bernardo's were running that. So, of course, Bernardo's are thinking of themselves as a major national charity, not just as a service in custody. That's a tiny part of what they do. Um, IMBs, these are the independent monitoring boards. Every prison has one. These are visitors who will um, go around and, and conduct a number of checks and balances on all prisoners, on all prisons, sorry, not prisoners. Um, and I include in prisons the YOIs, even though they might want to call themselves YOIs, not prisons. Um, so there will be an IMB, uh, a person or people who will be able to talk with your children while they're in custody. So please um, make sure that your child knows who is it, who is that person from the IMB that comes around and sees you. Uh, I put safeguarding partnerships on their LSCPs um, because they do have a responsibility, as I said er earlier, under um, under the 2004 Children Act they, for restraint, um, but also for the safety and well-being of those children in custody. Um, uh, strategically and system systemically rather than individually. So worth knowing what their role is. HMI prisons, um, they are the inspectors of prisons and they routinely, they do an annual report into children in custody. It's, it's quite a disturbing read quite often about what children say. What I would say to you is 
have a read of it when it comes out every year and ask yourself, how does this apply to my child in custody? So uh, useful, really useful report. And I mentioned it in the article that I wrote for Professional Social Work magazine. And then finally, and really importantly, are the, the organisations who are um, what we might call pressure groups. Um, really, really important in my view, because these are people who are endeavouring to change the system. Now, their role in individual children is really variable. The Howard League do do some uh, individual work, but unless um, my colleagues want to correct me, um, Article 39 and the Association um, sorry, the Alliance for Youth Justice don't necessarily do case work, although if somebody thinks I'm wrong there, I'm happy to be corrected. But these are pressure groups who are looking to change the system. Um, so well worth understanding what it is that they're doing um, and what it, what it is that kind of drives them because ultimately what they're looking for is the kind of big picture, long-term thinking, change of the system. Uh, and really, really worth engaging with that. So I will pause there and I'm really happy to take questions. Thanks, Wendy. I'm happy for difficult questions from you, Helen. I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> um, my only um, kind of question, firstly, just to say thank you. I thought that was a really good detailed look at that kind of gap between community service provision and what happens in the secure estate you know, and kind of looking at ways we can bridge that, really, which I know is a constant struggle. And it also made me think at the start about some research carried out by Lisa Warwick, Tom Disney, Harry Ferguson and others about how when young people are placed far away, be it in the secure estate or in care, often it's that kind of out of sight, out of mind mm -hmm. issue where, you know, for busy practitioners, having someone who's placed and being ostensibly cared for elsewhere is kind of like, OK, I don't need to worry about that one to the same extent as I do my other young people, um, which obviously isn't the case. And I think that is a big part of what we need to think about in practice. Um, my only question and I don't want to cut across anybody else was about um, and you did touch on it but about I know when you started in that role it will have been quite a, you know you will have cut into the pandemic yeah. um, and about the difference between your sort of pandemic experience and and what came after if you like as that was starting to yeah, have a reduced yeah. impact yeah, so a couple of things, um, a couple of things there, Helen, really, really good question. So if I just respond to your first comment first, so um, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, absolutely. It happens. It definitely happens for people in the community. I can certainly recall working in um, managing placements teams where a child, you know, oh, thank goodness for that. He's in a YOI tonight, which means that a couple of things. One is I don't have to find a placement for him. And the second thing is it means that I know he or she is alive tonight. Yeah, because if you're really that worried about a child, you are actively thinking, oh, thank goodness for that. At least I now know where he is. So, yes, children, um, thankfully, um, really wanting to touch wood before I say this, um, children do get quite significantly harmed in custody. It's been a little while since a child died in custody. Thank goodness. Um, so I can see why somebody might think that they'd be safer there. But that does not mean it is a safe and happy place for every child because it's not. So it is really important. How can you maintain contact with that child? Now, that segues really nicely, actually, Helen, into the discussion about the pandemic, because when I worked in the YCS, I was there about six months before the pandemic hit. And the world that we're in now, where we do things like this on Teams, was just not a thing in the prison service at all you know they just did not have things like laptops and access to teams and so on it just wasn't it wasn't there so the idea that you would conduct a meeting on teams was just not not even part of the narrative that meant that that kind of exacerbated the distance if you like now as the pandemic became a thing um, the, the YOIs had something called, in fact, lots of prisons did, the purple visits, which meant that children could see their families on screen, if you like. Um, and also we had some meetings taking place on screen. So it kind of opened the metaphorical doors that it was a governor that used that term first, opened the metaphorical doors in a very positive way. And that was a positive thing about the pandemic is it kind of speeded up 
that we were all talking to each other on screen and we made each other much more accessible, which is really important for, the, for those children. What I would say is it did mean, and we did see, some people, especially some community people, who would say, can I not do this meeting on Teams because it's a really long way for me to get to Weatherby or Cookhamwood or, you know, wherever. And actually, no, there are times when you do need to get on the train or on the motorway and you need to go and see your child and see them face to face. So we did, there were some times when we did have to push some community professionals, no, please come in and see him, do you know what I mean? So that was, was definitely a thing. Also, when there were a number of staff, and it, this is still the case, a number of staff in the YOIs who, who are relatively new in their career and therefore have never worked in an environment that wasn't pandemic. Do you see what I mean? So the idea, and you'll know um, horrifically that so many children were in their, cell, in their rooms for very long periods of time during the day, um, during the pandemic. What that means is that you are never having to do, you know, deal with a kind of 10 handed restraint because kids are fighting with each other because they're not all out at the same time. Do you see what I mean? So the idea that you have to navigate and manage a big group of children was just not a thing for some of those staff. So it was almost like they're having to relearn after what they'd learned. So they'd learned what how to be a prison officer in very unusual circumstances and gonna have to relearn. So um, yeah, it did. It definitely did have an impact. There were some positives. You know, you get screens that you would never have got before. But equally, there were some real difficulties that that's taken as read when actually you sometimes really just need to be getting there and seeing that child and, and asking questions like, what does the inside of his room look like? And how do I get to see the inside of his room? And actually, what I mostly see is a visit hall. Thanks for that, Wendy. That's really helpful. And I think we all sort of we're still in some ways taking time to recover from the legacy of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a question here from, apologies if I mispronounce your name, Salia. Oh, um, Salia. I know Salia. Hello. <laughs> ah, great. So, I think, Salia, so what you're, what you're talking about is how do children's voices um, kind of permeate into the, the, the way that policy and process is written and the way that... Um, and the way that the prison is run. So not as much, not, not as, much as it could is the quick answer. Um, there are some policies written, most definitely, where a child's voice is absolutely critical. And the YCS generally has used um, organisations like Peer Power, and at one point they were trying to pull together a kind of strategic youth advisory group, so a group of young people with lived experience in order to be able to guide and drive policy procedure practice. Yeah, so the YCS does involve children in policy writing um, and uh, kind of practice delivery and so on, but not as much as you would think. So it's not a sophisticated participation offer. I would say that. What I would say is that most YOIs will have a children's council or a youth council that will get together. Again, that is not as sophisticated as you will see in the best um, in the best kind of advocacy services or local authority services. Um, uh, in just coming back to Sally's question about advocacy generally, um, the advocacy service that is commissioned in the YOIs and in the STC is commissioned by the YCS and is very uh, is very much um, it's kind of individual it's it's about individual children so it's kind of meeting the needs of individual children amplifying the voice of individual children but of course as part of their contract management and oversight they do of course say here are the themes that are arising so they do have that capacity to feed back to the YCS and it does then in itself inform practice and policy and we've certainly when I worked in the YCS we certainly asked the advocacy service what do you think about this thing that we're about to do so we use that way of engaging with the child's voice but the service itself, in my experience, was very much kind of individualised. How do we amplify this child's voice or that child's voice? Hopefully that makes sense. I'm just going to do that that way because I think that Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Salia. It's been great, Wendy. Thanks very much. Thank you. It's been really a great helpful. Mm. Yeah.
yeah brilliant okay so yeah. thanks again thank good to see you all do come along again thanks thank again, you Wendy.